Should I do test test? <laughs> How do we know? <laughs> it's on. Because it's on. Okay. Never mind. Oh, sorry. I am standing in the wrong spot. Yes, you are. Okay, that's better. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to Data Kind SG's event, Data Learn. Uh, so I see quite a f uh, few new faces today. Uh, so welcome to Data Kind Singapore. Uh, we are a volunteer chapter in Singapore. Data Kind actually originally started in the US in 2011. We've been, uh, we are a chapter. We've been here from 2014. Uh, so the Data Learn event is to, uh, we conduct Data Learn events to have uh, our volunteer base uh, learn about new tools, uh, best practices, and so on. So this uh, data learn is in preparation for our data dive, which is a hackathon-like event, but it is non-competitive, where uh, volunteers come together to help nonprofit organizations with their uh, data issues, any problems, any insights they want to derive, and so on. So that is next weekend, uh, from April 13th to 15th. Uh, so do sign up in our page, uh, meetup page, uh, for the event. RSVPs are open right now. Um, so uh, we, one of the main goals that we believe in is reproducibility of work, which is why we have this event here, which is focused on Docker. Um, hope you get uh, good uh, experience today, and you're able to follow. Uh, you put to use what you learn from the workshop in data time next time. We hope to see you and also in your work. Thank you. Let me hand it over to Paul, who will lead the workshop. Thank you, Archana. Okay. Let me just put this mic if I can. And then. So good evening again, once, uh, everyone. So today, before I move on to the actual uh, presentation and workshop, um, because our platform, uh, the Play With Docker, for those of you who have received the mail, sometimes it has uh, bandwidth issues. So we might as well download the things that we need to do so that while I present a talk about the, the introduction or overview, uh, you can sort of uh, do the workshop until, until task one. So at least we save time by doing that. So what I'll do right now, if you can go to this uh, link um, for the slides, and then for those who need the internet connection, th that's the Wi-Fi uh, details, um, we'll I'll move forwards to, uh, forward to uh, this slide, uh, go to the actual uh, Jupyter Mini Workshop, uh, go to this uh, tiny URL, Jupyter Lab, and then if you can go until, uh, until task one, which is basically pulling uh, the Docker image. We'll explain uh, later on um, um, on how we go through the rest of the workshop. But at least to save time while I speak, you can already download. Yep. So at any point, if anyone has problem or question, just raise your hand. Uh, I, I can help answer or uh, we have mentors around also who can help. So I assume everyone, uh, because we've sent the email, has already uh, an account in uh, Play With Docker. If you don't have yet, uh, kindly do so. So at least uh, you, you would need this later when we do the workshop. And then this is our agenda for uh, today. Um, what we'll do is uh, to give a context on the workshop, uh, we'll recap on what we've discussed uh, on reproducibility. For those who watched the first video, thanks. Uh, that will be that will help set the context of this uh, uh, session. And then we'll move on to the Dockerized tools, the data tools that we use in data kind, like uh, R Studio and uh, Jupyter Notebooks that are containerized, and then we use in the data dive. And then we this year we'll be introducing a new workflow on how we. Um, do the task during a data dive, like from volunteer, um, when I do the analysis, um, where do I send this output to, where do I check in, and, and so on, and what happens next in the pipeline. And then last, we'll move into the Jupyter Lab mini workshop. 
to explore uh, on the new um, IDE or the front end <coughs> of uh, Jupyter Notebooks. Yep. So we'll start with our reproducibility so that everyone will be on the same page. So what do we mean by reproducibility? Uh, we expect, let's say, um, uh, Bill, let's say Bill is our one of our volunteers. Um, Bill has a, a as an analysis, like by doing step one, two, and three, um, we determine or uh, have an insight that program A of this nonprofit is way better than program uh, B, for example. That's the claim. Of course, let's say on the other hand, let's say we have another volunteer called Ted. Uh, Ted should be able to reproduce whatever Bill was doing or what Bill is claiming. So what he should be able to do, he should be able to get uh, the code from uh, Bill and then on uh, Ted's machine, let like, say I'm Ted, I'm able to run through, hey, I'm doing step one, two, three, and go, oh, I, I am able to reproduce the results. So that's the expectation. Not that, because sometimes you'll have, hey, uh, this, this code is not random, I cannot reproduce the machine. So um, we aim to have reproducibility so that one year down the road, two years down the road, we can still produce, let's say, Bill's analysis. So how do we do that? So in data kind context, previously, uh, we used to version our codes so that, uh, let's say, the version one of Ted, uh, so, sorry, Bill, version one of Bill's analysis uh, was um, indicating that, uh, hey, uh, program one is better. So that's version one. And then later on, with new data, and then you, hey, there's a bug in the code, you fix it. Uh, and then after the fix, it turns out that program B is better. So when someone wants to replicate this, at least they know, hey, which version of the code did you run to um, uh, arrive to that result? So we should be able to do that. So previously, uh, we were able to uh, achieve that via the uh, versioning the code. But after that, we realized that, hey, um, code alone is not enough to achieve reproducibility because even if you have the code um, running on a, a volunteer's machine, volunteer's machine could be <coughs> different in many ways. Uh, one could be running in Linux, one could be running in Mac OS, one could be running in Windows, and sometimes they have not the, they don't have the, the, the base uh, libraries that is able to support to run the code. So there could be a lot of issues there. Um, but in, since um, uh, in the next, uh, in this phase, uh, apart from versioning the code, we now also version the environment. So you have both version code and then version environment so that when you have together, you'll be able to reproduce the code more effectively. And then just to give a background, uh, we discussed this also in the first video if you watch, uh, just to give a context on some of the common uh, Docker or container terms that we have. Uh, we have three uh, usual terms, which is uh, container registry. Container registry, you can um, uh, think of it as sort of a market, let's say uh, a, a sort of repository of various uh, IDEs or images or environments that we have. And then, let's say uh, Ted wants to uh, replicate um, uh, Bill's uh, analysis, right? So what Ted will do, Ted will go to the container registry um, he phones up, hey, uh, Bill, what version of the environment did you use to, for your analysis? And then uh, Bill says, hey, I, I, for the new analysis, I used version 2. So Ted, what Ted will do, he goes to the, the uh, container registry, finds which uh, the version 2 of the environment, takes that file. That file is called the image. Uh, that, that's, the, that's the Docker image that we pulled from the Docker registry. So once... Um, um, Ted has that image, he runs that image in his machine, once it's running, that instance of the um, uh, of the image that is running, that's the container. That's the real ID, the, the ID that Ted will use to produce this uh, uh, analysis. So, are good so far? So next, um, in data kind, we have various uh, IDEs that we use for uh, analysis. And I understand who uh, uses R in, in this room. Anyone uses Python? Anyone uses other languages <coughs> apart from R or Python? Yeah, because you can use Scala or Java or C-sharp. But in, in, um, in data kind, 
Um, for now, we serve, um, I think, four um, potential IDs that a volunteer can use during data dive. One is uh, Jupyter. Um, our notebooks via Jupyter. We have uh, Python notebooks via Jupyter as well. And then um, in the nearly the in the half of last year, or I think during the first data dive last year, we also introduced R Studio. So it's your R Studio, but it's running in the browser, and we also have version for that. And then uh, today we are uh, launching a new. Um, IDE that we will be supporting moving forward, that is Jupyter Lab, that will be the context of the workshop uh, later. Yeah. So, um, just to demo, I'll just demo this quickly. This is one of our uh, image from um, from our stack. Uh, I'll just uh, show how easy it is to run uh, an, uh, an environment. So, I'll just copy this. So, it's basically a uh, uh, Docker command which has some ports to expose. And what you can see here, this KIO. So KIO, uh, as explained a while ago, that's our repository where our uh, images of environments lives. And then this OJOY R Studio um, colon 1.0.2, 1.0.2 is the version of that environment. So that's how we crack it. So I'll just copy this. I'll go to Docker Playground. I'll create a new instance. So this is like, Hopefully, uh, we don't ex uh, experience a uh, bandwidth issue. So I'll just uh, click, uh, paste it there, and then it, now what it does is it tries to pull that image from our repository, which is uh, KIO. And then hopefully once it uh, completes, we will see a port uh, export uh, uh, visible here, and uh, we should be able to uh, access the um, RStudio IDE from the browser. So, part is extracting, and then generally it takes uh, maybe two minutes or so. <coughs> yeah, it's there. So, it's done. It has the port. I'll click the port, and it should open the, R the login. So, I'll just put RStudio. By the way, all, all of this, if you watch the first video, all of these are in the repository, the instructions, the documentation. This is in the GitHub repository, so you can. Uh, um, try it on your own also. R Studio. R Studio. Sign in. And voila. You should have the R Studio ID. It takes a while to do it. Yeah, so once you have that, and let's say I just open a file here. Uh, so it's like if you're familiar with R Studio, it's basically R Studio already. It's just running in the browser. I'll just uh, run a demo uh, graphics. So any um, command that you need, you can uh, run here as well. So I'll just uh, so I'm context switching from Python and R. So I'll just uh, enter. So the plots you can see from here. So it's a, it paves like a normal R Studio. So that's one of our IDs. Um, you, for um, Jupyter Notebooks, you can try also on your own, um, um, maybe after the session or so on. So that's one example of the environment that we are supporting. So let me go back here in, in the presentation mode. Excuse me. Yes. If I save, if I save anything in R Studio, yeah. does it get saved? Uh, why does it get saved? Uh, so good question. The, the current command that I gave here, I didn't okay. put uh, dash V, which is the volume. So currently, it's uh, volatile. So uh, during the data dive, if you notice in our other uh, examples, we usually map the host machine where you can put your files there, and then the containers path. So you, when you map the two, whatever you save in the container gets saved in your local uh, um, directory. But it's okay. Well, during the data dive, we have a help desk for Docker. Uh, so you can come and then we'll uh, um, resolve issues in there. Yeah. So next is uh, the data dive, which uh, uh, Archana has explained. Um, these are just links uh, in the previous data dive that we have uh, last year. So we uh, marked like a hat on, but there's no price. We uh, do it for, for good and then uh, help the non our, our nonprofit partners. And 
hopefully we'll be able to use the tools that we introduced here uh, in the first place. So in this uh, data dive, we want to structure a bit so that at least it will help us manage uh, the deliverables and then how to uh, ensure that whatever we check in or put in the repository uh, are of good quality. So, um, so you have three personas here in the workflow. You have the uh, volunteer um, who, who will mainly help in analyzing, getting insights uh, from the data of the nonprofits, and then produce a deliverable. The deliverable could be a number of things. It could be a Jupyter notebook, a uh, Python notebook, or our notebook. It could be a script, uh, our script that you've written in our studio, uh, maybe a visualization or the dashboard or something. And then once you're ready with that sort of uh, uh, piece of uh, configurable item, um, what you, uh, the volunteer will do is uh, they will push it to a branch. We, we call it an integration branch for now. And then in that branch, uh, later on, Junior Data Dev will have a detailed instruction on how to go about this step by step. But just on a high level view, once it, it, it's in the integration branch, we have another uh, volunteer called uh, Docker Captain. Docker Captain usually um, name them for the, because they will be helping us curate the deliverables. So curation means if you watch uh, the second video, that's for the Docker Captains. What they will do is they will take the deliverable from the volunteer and then uh, Docker Captain is like Ted. So what Ted will do is um, Bill claims that uh, so-and-so uh, is uh, working. So what uh, Ted will do, get the deliverable uh, get the corresponding environment and try to confirm that, hey, is it really working as expected? So once uh, that confirms, or the Docker captain confirms that it's good and it's reproducible, um, this uh, piece of code, let's say a, a Jupyter notebook or a script, at the top will put a metadata that, hey, this, uh, this particular piece of code is working on environment version 2.0 or something. So at least we'll know that the next time we'll, we run that script, we know that, hey, which uh, environment should I use to run this uh, analysis? Uh, that's the Docker captain. So once the Docker captain is okay with the result, uh, from the integration branch, the Docker captain will push into main branch or in GitHub terms, that's the master branch. And then we have another uh, persona, which is the GitHub admin, that will sort of try to review the final review of the deliverable and then approve if it's good. Yeah. Any questions so far in this workflow? We'll have a more detailed at least uh, maybe uh, instructions during the data then. Is it? Yep. And then, so I'm mining a while ago in the video, sorry. <laughs> so I, hopefully I did some good gestures. Um, so these are the links to our previous videos. Um, if you haven't watched it, I encourage you to watch at least uh, the first video is for Docker Basics and Docker as data tools that will give us context on how to use uh, the image, uh, what's Docker, and, and all of those. And then the second video uh, is more of architecture and how to curate the deliverables to ensure that, um, that to help um, reproduce the volunteers' uh, analysis. And then, hey, we're here. Um, we can start the Jupyter Lab mini workshop. So, if you've gone through the, the document, um, at least if you can reach and ask uh, task one, that would be great because that's the one that is taking a long time. What I'll do is I'll, I'll try to follow the, um, the document uh, so that you can follow along with me. But if uh, there's bandwidth issue, I think, uh, let me check if I already have, uh, have something to Oh, So let me test a bit. This is the previous uh, image that I pulled uh, for the Jupyter Lab. If it works, uh, then that's our backup. But anyway, um, it looks like it's working. But for this, uh, if you're starting from uh, task one, um, you need to, in this instruction, if you're following, you need to create a new instance. So this is the new instance, right? And then um, the next uh, step here is, uh, the next step would be to clone the repository. 
uh, this repository contains our workshop um, <coughs> materials and demos and files, so we donate here so we can get the files first. And then once it's loaded, um, the next is to give the setup permissions. I'm in step five of task one, if you want to follow. Copy that, and then paste, and then enter. And then the next one, this is usually the one that is problematic because we're... I think we need to put a question. Okay, um, question, uh, anyone uh, who is stuck? Can help, just raise your hands, people will... Can you raise your hand if you're stuck anywhere? How about the rest are able to follow the instructions? Good. So I'll I'll continue for now. Uh, we, if you have if you're stuck anywhere at any point, just raise your hand. We have mentors around to uh, help uh, gather. So I mean step six. Usually step six is the one that is problematic. Um, we're using pay for Docker because it's free, and um, of, of course. Um, if Sometimes there are problems with the bandwidth issue, but if, if all works good, uh, then we should be able to pull an image when we copy this. So I'm, I just uh, copied uh, the command from uh, step six, and we should be able to uh, get our image. There. So apparently, what it's doing is pulling the image. It's going to extract and then uh, uh, once this is done, it will launch the Jupyter lab. This is the one that is uh, usually taking uh, a bit of time. Once you, if anyone who has finished task one already, okay, that's good. Anyone going through task one? Okay. Task one is the one that is uh, one that is usually taking long. So for for this, I'll just explain a bit. So while it's loading, I'll just go back to the doc document here, and I'll explain uh, what is this document uh, doing. So I'll just uh, uh, open this. So here, so this is normal Docker command, Docker run. So it will what it will do is it will run if there is any existing. Uh, image in your machine, it will run that uh, um, this particular uh, image which is the Jupyter lab 1.0.0. However, if it doesn't find anything in the machine, what it will do, it, it will go to the source uh, which is from TIO and then it will try to pull the image uh, from there. Since uh, our instance we just launched, it does nothing. So what it did was to pull the image from the uh, repository and then pull and then uh, once it's pulled, it, it will run the, the container. So here, the next one is uh, this one um, is is uh, to enable the Jupyter Lab option. Um, this a particular base image. This particular base image is based on. Uh, uh, a mini um, mini anaconda or something. It has the, anyway, the, the basic image of this supports both Jupyter Lab and Jupyter Notebook. So if I don't put this uh, Jupyter Enable Lab 1, uh, it will just launch a normal notebook. So that's why we put this for the extra functionality. Remember that uh, for Jupyter, um, there are two IDEs uh, currently that they support. That the one is the normal notebook, and then the Jupyter Lab, which is the ne the next generation front end for Project Jupyter. Uh, from their talk previously in conferences and from I think from their documentation, the plan was to eventually uh, Jupyter Lab will replace the Jupyter notebooks. Yeah. So the next one, which is uh, this, which is the port. You have 8888 and 8888 here. So uh, why do the first one is uh, from the local machine where this will be running. And then the second one is the one that is inside the container. But since we're running Jupyter, um, 8888 is the sort of default port that we use for Jupyter. So that's the one that we'll be accessing. 
the next one, which is free, the one that, um, uh, related to Vidya's uh, question a while ago, like, if I have files, uh, where does it, uh, how can I run it from the IDE? So this is how we map it. Um, this first um, folder, uh, this is the one that we just pulled, right? We, you remember we, we did a git clone um, of container yourself repo. This is where it went. This is from the local machine. And then the next one, the home job, uh, that's the uh, folder from the inside the container. Yeah. So let's go back and hopefully, hopefully uh, our pool is finished. And it's uh, done. So once the pool is done, is you'll see a token here, um, and then a port link here. So what you'll do is to click this, and it will open a page. Right? Sometimes this doesn't work. I don't know if fortunately it worked today. <laughs> so here it will ask you for a password or a token. So what will happen is uh, we have the the token here, right? Just click that. Of course, it won't open in local host, but I usually do that so that it's easy for me to copy this. I control C, close this, and then in the actual notebook, I'll, uh, in the actual interface, I'll just paste and then log in. Oh, font. Let me check. I have three tabs with Jupyter Notebook. So let me uh, figure out uh, which. Control C. And then close this. And then. Is this good enough? Size? So I just paste this here. Log in. If this doesn't help, okay. This doesn't work because it's a it's a different tab. Sorry, I'll close this. I think it's on the other tab. Okay. I open the two uh, windows. Let me open close this. And then I forgot which tab was working earlier. So now once you um, see this, this is our uh, Jupyter uh, lab interface. So um, this is the end of task one. So we launched the Jupyter uh, lab, so that's okay. And the next thing that we'll do, we'll move on to um, task, uh, task. Before we move on to task uh, two, just to explain a bit on the different uh, areas of uh, uh, the lab, the menu bars, the sidebar, and main board area. So here, <laughs> here you have the menu bar, which is on, on top. And then we have the left sidebar on, on this left side, and then the main working area. The main working area is usually uh, where we do uh, all our launch our notebooks, uh, launch the different notebooks here. For now, you can see Python 3, because when we did the image, we only included Python 3. But ideally, in uh, the future, if you need R, you can put R there also. If you need other languages uh, to be support, you can put there also. And then uh, apart from that, you have terminal text editor, which is usually the origin that an existing feature of Jupyter. Yeah. By the way, if um, 
is if some of you are still working on uh, task one, don't worry. This is being recorded, and you already have access to the to the lab. You can also continue later. So I'll just continue for now. So what's next in our task? Next task is to sort the cells. So uh, sort the cells of what? So from the browser, the will click sort me out. Uh, I find a notebook. So here in the file browser, it will sort me out. I'll just double click. It will open. It will open this. And then, by the way, is the size okay or is it too big? Just good. So from here, you'll notice that uh, we have uh, a bunch of cells, uh, which is like a normal notebook. And maybe the ordering is not that uh, good because we have uh, the first step, which is uh, at the bottom. So traditionally, what happens in a normal notebook? What do you do in the current notebook? Let me open a bit uh, on this side. I'll just open a normal Jupyter notebook so we have some comparison on how we do things uh, previously. Notebooks is one of the uh, free platforms that can host either Jupyter Notebook and Jupyter Lab, but I'll uh, share that later. Uh, I'll just open a sample uh, uh, notebook so that we have contrast what's different from the what's different from the part notebook and uh, and the Jupyter Lab. So here you have the same uh, repository or at least similar. I'll just go to the workshop. And then let's say I'll open one of the notebooks there. Twitter lab. Then, uh, just, uh, okay, I don't have the. Let's, let's try the normal. Uh, yeah, I'll just open a random notebook. So we'll just launch the. So here, um, let's say this this uh, this cell, right? If you want to move up, what do we do in the current one? So here uh, we have the up uh, arrow move selected uh, cells that are selected up. So let's say imagine if you need to if your cell that you need to move is in in the bottom. Let's say uh, this one uh, is near the bottom. I need to move it this up. So what I, I, I'll be doing, I'll need to click this how many times? How many cells you need to move? But uh, in, in Jupyter Lab, what, uh, what it enables us to do is I can click this side. I can click both cells because essentially this one, which, which is the label, markdown label, is also a cell. I can click that. I can shift, click this. And then uh, click. Oh, sorry. Yes. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, for for those that are stuck, can we uh, retry? There's a um, a instruction there, right? Because partly um um we're using a free platform, so sometimes the bandwidth is not good. So what we should do in the at the after the picture, there's a note that if it stuck um um here right? uh let me just show you a bit. If it's stuck, uh, click delete uh, from this uh, interface. Click delete, and then once the instance is deleted. Uh, create a new instance and start from uh, step three. Yep. Um, unfortunately, we need to keep doing that until we have this uh, uh, 8888 port. Yeah. Unless there's another way uh, for those that have uh, um, Docker installed in the machine, uh, you can just um, git clone in your local machine and then uh, run. Run the 
run the Docker command from the lab. That is one option uh, if if uh, you already have Docker installed. But yeah, I assume a number of people won't have Docker on the machine for now. During the actual data dive, if you have problems installing Docker, then you can help also. Yeah. So um, if, let's say you have several tries already in putting the image. Uh, don't worry. If you can fa finish it during this workshop, um, our workshop, you, you already have the instructions. Uh, it's also being rewarded. So if it doesn't, uh, it doesn't happen during this workshop, you can follow along. I'll, I'll still guide. At least you'll get the overview on what features are available in uh, Jupyter Lab interface. And then later on after the session, you can try again you go back home. So I'll just continue um, where we're being. Uh, sort cells. How do we sort cells in Jupyter Lab? <coughs> so I just click this. Um, let me just control. Uh, this one is okay because I need to uh, show a little bit more of the screen. I'll just click this. Shift, click, and then I'll just move a bit. And then drop there. So now we have drag and drop for the cells. We don't have to like click up, 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 up until so many uh, cells that we have to move. So you can um, drag and drop uh, your cells now. So that's cool. Which um, part are we? We're in the task two. Once we've uh, got the data, we put it up. And now uh, we just need to run this. I'll just run this so that at least you'll get to know that, hey, it still functions like a normal machine. So here, I'll just click run, which is the normal interface of Jupyter, run all cells, it will run all. Um, so here we're getting the data, display the table from the data using Pandas data frame, and then uh, we group the, uh, the group by type of donation. In this data, we use the donation uh, from Red Cross. Um, then we use a uh, visualization library called Plotly. Um, we have a, a use it to display a stock bar chart to you have the different kinds of uh, blood donations on your system, blood, uh, hope blood, so you have the visualization uh, display. So of course a not normal in this case. So what's next? You are able to display. Next is uh, we want to explore more graphs because uh, graph helps us get insights better because it's visual. Uh, what we'll do next is to have explore another one. Uh, so the one that we just saw that was using Plotly. Next, we're going to uh, explore Bouquet, uh, which is also a library for data visualization. I just double click that. So here you have a Bouquet demo, and it, it looks like this, right? Uh, in the workshop, it says, in the workshop, it says it should look like this. You should have a cell under bouquet. In the scatter plot, you should have a command. Uh, for this, this is not an issue with Jupyter Lab. This is, is an issue with my setup uh, in the image, but I didn't get a chance to fix it. So uh, it needs to be investigated. For, but for now, uh, what we'll do is um, a workaround. If you see like this, just run all the cells. And then close this and double click this again. And voila, you have the fix. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it is yet to be investigated why it, it worked that way, but yeah, it works. Um, once we have that, um, click run on cells from the menu. So what we'll do is, uh, this one is a visualization uh, library also. So what it does is uh, from various uh, different kinds of plots, it will uh, run through uh, some data and then visualize them in different ways. So what I'll do here, I'll just run and run all cells. So it loads the library and then it should display the various graphs. Yeah, bar graphs, uh, 
periodic table. I didn't know you have periodic table as in. Four ten. we don't have. Ah, yo, uh, yeah, we have four ten. And then um, the other one is. Uh, oh, the other one is an error. But uh, this error is part of the workshop. So what we'll do next, as you can see here, you'll see an error also in the workshop. Thank you. So here, uh, scroll down, you can see various graphs, and then Jupyter Lab supports context menu. So we're going to use context menu to delete this uh, cell which has an error. The error, but basically, um, it cannot generate the graph because we have missing data, because I didn't load the data. And I, yeah. So we're going, since we're not going to use it, we're going to delete it. But previously, when you delete a cell, you can just do a DD, right? And then that's about it. But um, there's more to that. Before I we go to the deletion part, if you right click, not only that you can delete cells on that context, you can also do other stuff like split cell. Split cell is not in the workshop, but I think it's cool to, to show. So if you have like a very long cell and you want to uh, split it, um, let's say here, I want to split the cell in two, so I just right click here, split cell, uh, and then it's split. And then I click here again, and then I'll split here. So it's, if you have a long, um, uh, big, very big cell, you can do a split cell. But since our objective here, we want to just delete the cell. Oh no, I split the cell three times, so I need to do delete three times. But good thing there's also undo, so I'll, I'll click uh, C. <coughs> It it uh, merges and then uh, uh, we are we are back to the uh, one cell, which we can right click and delete, and then it's done. Yeah, so far so good. Um, what's next? Uh, we can see the visualization. We have the code it's running. Um, how about? Uh, we just we don't want to see the code. Usually, when let's say when we do the presentation during the data dive, right? We just let's say want to present the outputs of the graph. We don't want to like display it each and bit of the code. So uh, what we can do is uh, let's say here right, is a, a lot of code and then graphs. We want to limit only to the vis the output visualizations. So Jupyter Lab uh, fortunately has a feature called um, if you go to view. You can collapse all code. If you, I do this, then you'll just be left with the visualizations, and then you can just explain like how how this is and so on. The table, and then the last part, and so on. Yeah. Next thing. Uh, collapse. We're now in step uh, six, task two. Um, now we're on the left. We're left with just the labels and visualizations. Uh, what we want to do next is. We want to put um, these two uh, visualization, mainly the scatter plot, let's say, and then uh, the bar graph in their own windows. Because in uh, Jupyter Lab, um, as opposed to uh, the normal Jupyter Notebook, we now have the ability to have the layout of different sort of windows. So what we'll do is, uh, this output we already have, uh, we want to export this in, in its own uh, Windows just in case the this a bit so that at least you get to appreciate the workspace. I right click this and here you can see a create new view for output. So I'll just click that. Um, we want to uh, examine two um, two graphs. So for the bar graph, we want to view also. Right click and then uh, click new view for output and then. Uh, here we'll use Jupyter Labs uh, layout um, feature. Uh, we can drag on the right. Uh, here we can drag on the right also. Okay, and then uh, this one we can drag the bottom. Yeah, you can basically uh, lay out uh, accordingly. This uh, adjustable. So uh, on this side. Yes. How, how do you like zoom in, zoom out? Let's say you want to see the entire book in this small window. Uh, this one? No, like, like in output view. In output view, what do you want? How do you zoom out or zoom in? 
you want to uh, view this, um, actually it's part of the lab, but if you're interested, it's a uh, control ship enter. Yeah, but uh, we'll, we'll, yeah, let's not get ahead of the features. I'll just uh, uh, go back for that. We'll, we'll go through that uh, feature, yeah, no worries. So here, we have the, the fruit towns by year, and then we have the uh, iris, uh, another graph at the bottom. So now what we, we want to do is, let's say, um, just following the workshop, uh, let's say what we want to do is, uh, apart from doing the layout, um, we want to see this uh, dynamic update of the graphs. So here, uh, remember we collapsed the code a while ago. If you see this three button, that's to expand. So we have now have the the code that generates these uh, bar graphs. Um, what we want to do is, let's say, I don't like, uh, this is uh, this is our row. This, let's say we don't have, the, this this data is wrong. Instead, the opposite should be oranges, let's say. So I'll, I'll do oranges here. And then let's say this one, um, let's say uh, we are in uh, 2015, uh, we have a count of five instead of two for this particular data, so I'll just put uh, five. So before I run this, notice, notice this area. I just control minus. So you can see a little bit more of this. So this one, what you expect is you can see apples here for now, right? You can see that the count in 2015 is two. Uh, since we changed the code here, this apple should be uh, oranges. <coughs> And then this uh, um, count will be five. But remember, this is a separate window. So uh, we also have a separate output uh, in our normal Jupyter notebook. But since uh, Jupyter Lab is uh, whatever you see in Jupyter Lab, let's say the outputs, they are deriving from the same model. They have this uh, model-based architecture. So whatever changes in the model, whether you have a like, few outputs there, all will be updated. So I'll just show you that in a bit. So this one, I'll just shift enter, and then see both screens are updated. Yeah, cool. Uh, and then of course it's not oranges also here, oranges there. Yeah. Next. So we we updated this. Uh, so this is um, uh, we're done with task three. We'll move next to task four which is uh, how do we clean the workspace? We have a lot of clutter currently here. We want to, let like, say, start new. So, I mean, nor 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 normally you can go to like various uh, uh, windows in this layout and then close them accordingly, right? You can close this. But there's also another way, because I want to introduce you to the side panel. This uh, tabs view. Then here in the tabs, you can just uh, close the tabs on this side. So just close. And then you close the tabs, and then you want to shut down the notebooks that we've run a while ago, and shut down from the, this running panel as well. Yeah. And then we're clean, we're back to the uh, base one. That's how we clean, and then um, let's uh, explore another feature of Jupyter Lab, which is uh, so the support for Markdown. So I'll just uh, open this. So what I'll do, I'll go to Files, in the files, you'll see uh, Markdown Python. Uh, what I'll do, I just right click. So now you have uh, support to open the Markdown as a, in an editor, and then open the Markdown in the preview. So if I open it in, in an editor, I can have something like the Markdown editor. But usually, what you want is you want to be able to type in your Markdown editor. You want to see how does it look when it's previewed. So since we have the layout um, uh, feature, why not use the layout and then open another one, right? So I can have a markdown view, and then since you can drag and drop and snap, um, and just snap it to the right, then this is your markdown preview. And then let's say I'll tap here, uh, another header called uh, Jupyter Lab. And then watch the other side. Is awesome. yeah. So it's you get the feedback uh, right after you move the type. So this is easy for because when you don't have this feature, what you do? You type and then open in the browser. Does it look okay? And then go back. So 
it's a uh, it takes this sort of cycle, but at least if it's instant, it's it's good in that way. So um, I'll do next is uh, let's uh, explore another picture. So here, um, before I move to the next picture, I forgot to install Matplotlib. So I'll uh, I'll uh, use this launcher. I'll run in the terminal. So we can do a uh, pip install here. Pip install Matplotlib. So we'll install the corresponding library. And once it's uh, once it's done, uh, I'll go back to this same 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 Python uh, uh, sorry, so same same markdown uh, uh, file that we are doing. But what we have here is in the markdown editor, I can right click, I can um, create console for editor. So if I right click create console for editor, I can choose the set uh, the kernel for for that uh, uh, markdown file, and then it opens a console. So, what does this console do? Um, so, generally for the markdown uh, file, right? So, you, have, you might have like uh, Python codes there or <coughs> code snippets. I want to test whether that code snippet, does that code snippet really work? What I'll do is I'll go there, uh, put my cursor there, shift enter, you'll see it there in the console. Um, that's quite simple. Uh, let's have a more uh, uh, Dense code block. We have the matplotlib code uh, there. I'll just shift enter and then it runs in the console. And then, of course, if you want to do some visualization apart from displaying the table, go to another code, shift enter, and then you have everything. So, at least by that way, it saves you the cycle of uh, running again, paste, pasting the code, putting it into uh, an editor, and running there. But here, it's just one stop shop. Uh, click on the code you want to run, shift enter, and there you go. That's the power of Jupyter Lab. It's in the it's in the workshop as well. So then the next task, the second to the last task that uh, we want to explore, uh, just like uh, what was asked a while ago. <coughs> What about if you want to zoom into each of the uh, files, right? How do we do it? So, um, Jupyter Lab also uh, supports that. So a while ago, we have this uh, shortcut, right, for uh, zooming each of the file. Uh, you can Control Shift Enter, and it will zoom to the uh, current um, window that you're uh, viewing. It will uh, even even like a. Uh, um, uh, check the next uh, window. So to check the next window, uh, uh, as you said in your workshop, you can control shift and then um, the right bracket. You can you can view it like that. Sorry. And then shift um, left bracket to go back to the previous window. So you can basically look through it. So see, uh, even though even the console you can so if you want to go back to the multi-tab view, just click Control Shift Enter again, and then you're back where you are. So it's easy to like, hey, I want to zoom in into this window because the window is too small. Zoom in, single document view, and then once you're okay done, you can go back to uh, uh, to the multi uh, window view by just the the shortcut which is Control Shift Enter. And then lastly. Um, what we'll uh, also look into is is explore the file formats. So in in Jupyter Lab, Jupyter Lab um, supports a number of file formats. Some of which you need an extension in order to support, like J JSON. But some are also built in. So what I'll do right now is here in your uh, folder or folder uh, file browser, you have a data folder there. I got this um, uh, data from the main Jupyter demo, but since so that I don't have to open another window, I just copied it here. So we, we have a few files here. Um, we have, uh, oh, before we move on, 
um, our window part is uh, cluttered. So at least to make the demo, demo uh, uh, sector, uh, I'll just uh, heat up a bit. So that will uh, back to the last one. So, um, which is a cleaner uh, workspace. So once our workspace is clean, um, I can also um, drag and drop the files from the file browser, uh, drag it into the window, and I can view the, the files accordingly. So I just drag the, the, it's a picture, it's a JPEG file, I can just drag, it supports that. Uh, there's also a Vega Lite um, file, uh, which is a, Vega, a JSON file. I can drag uh, that also, and I can view the, the graph that is generated accordingly. And then uh, let's say there's a CSV. Let's say we want to have a quick view of the CSV to like uh, to have a feel on how the data looks like. I can just drag this uh, CSV uh, the bottom, and then at least you can see there. I can, I can scroll down, scroll up. Uh, by the way, I, I don't have the the actual file here, uh, but from the original uh, conference demo for the Jupyter Lab, they can support at least they claim to support it. I think they demoed it also. Uh, one trillion columns by one trillion rows. Uh, this technology, I think they, they use uh, Phosphor.js. Anyone heard of Phosphor.js before? Uh, they use that uh, uh, library for supporting this. So let's say they, this, there's one demo here for Phosphor.js where you have a lot of cells, you can drag seamlessly, and then you can scroll seamlessly also. Yeah. So it's, it's quite powerful, I think. And scroll if you have like very big data. Uh, and then the other one that I like is the JSON because let's say we have data sets that has um, uh, coordinates for, for maps, right? So we want to uh, see like, uh, hey, uh, in, let's say Red Cross, for example, which centers uh, are located which in Singapore or something. So I can just drag that uh, file if you have a JSON. Uh, uh, JSON format for that, and then uh, I can just uh, uh, view it there. So we have like a WhatsApp shop. I don't have to go to the uh, separate browser and then view the thing. I can have like all in my in, in, in one view. And uh, just a bonus thing. Let's say you ha I have a workshop that is printed in PDF. Um, I can just go and say I have this uh, files right. This is not the workshop, but I'll share it with you. So, go back to home. I think we have one PDF file here. Double click. And, uh, what is it taking? It should support uh, PDF also. I think the PDF is quite big, but once it's load, uh, you have the uh, thing there also. That means, uh, if this workshop, right, uh, you can export it as PDF, and you can also put it in the file, and then you can have the reference from the same windows. Yeah. So I think uh, that's the, no, that's not the last task. We have, uh, one is uh, virtual list. Let's say you go back home, uh, uh, you forgot some of the keywords that I've mentioned. You want to post that again? Uh, and then uh, Jupyter Lab has this tab for commands. And uh, it supports fuzzy search. So if let's say I want to turn the whole thing, I forgot which uh, option how to turn the whole thing into black. So uh, I'll just type dark, for example. And then I it's there. I just click it, and it will uh, turn it into black. And then hey, I I don't want black. I I want uh, the screen to go back to light again. So I'll just type light. It's a fuzzy search. You can. Uh, it uh, will uh, filter accordingly and then take that. And then we're back. Yeah. By the way, if you really want to dig deeper, it's here in the settings. Jupyter theme. But uh, in case you have other <laughs> other uh, commands that you want to search, then that's the main uh, purpose of that. Um, that's the last task. If you've completed that, congratulations. Um, this is a mini workshop, but uh, as uh, stated in this document, this is not by all uh, an exhaustive, exhaustive uh, <coughs> for all the Jupyter features. I think this is just a tip of the iceberg. 
there's more features there you can even do like presentations for but um, we just leave it so that we don't have all night or all day for this uh, but what I would like to do is we encourage you to explore more you have the links you have the access to the IDE um, you can go to the their documentation uh, which is really good I got the, the samples from there as well to learn more about Jupyter Lab and then moreover uh, apart from the data dive, um, usually we have monthly sessions. Uh, if you want to know like what's the next data kind of event, I want to use my data our Jupyter Lab skills for the, for, for for good. So you can find us out in Meetup, uh, data kind dash sg events. Yeah. So that's uh, for the workshop part. But wait, there's more. <laughs> uh, just. Uh, Present this. Um, we have uh, also let's say um, we use this tool, but how about how do we use this tool to collaborate with our other peers? Let's say we want to um, exchange ideas, maybe work on the same file. Um, in that case, usually you can have like a shared folder. Let's say you don't have that shared folder. Uh, right now, where's Yo? Uh, I'd like to invite Yo. Uh, can you come over here maybe so that it's, uh, we can interact with the audience? So, you can try this also, but for now, uh, Yoke and I are currently, let's say, working on the same project, same analysis. Uh, what we'll, uh, we want to do is, uh, uh, we want to explore, um, uh, so this is Jupyter Lab. Uh, you have the files and notebooks there, but let's say, uh, uh, we want to uh, collaborate together. There's an option to support Google Drive. So if you have that uh, settings, you can, whatever file I have in my Google Drive, I can share it to, let's say, you, and then we're on the same file. For this demo, we'll go through like some of the files. Uh, let's say, uh, first uh, file that will go is, let's say, the markdown. So I can see the markdown here. This is the markdown that we used a while ago. And then uh, we have a chat window also. Hi, yo, are you there? <laughs> you can see it. Yo is there, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so what we'll do is, uh, let's say here, um, I'll put um, a, uh, I'll put here um, Jupiter Lab. Can you put some description on Jupiter Lab below my? Uh, below my, uh, which one? I'm not writing by the way, he's writing. <laughs> but you can see that it's updating. And then you can see also the markdown preview. So we can work on the same document at the same time and it's like Google Docs, right? <laughs> uh, that, yeah, just uh, to have another example. Um, we have another file. Uh, let's say, we'll open, um, Okay, hopefully this works because we did uh, dry run this. So uh, in the Google Drive, we have a shared notebook. <coughs> this shared notebook, uh, we have get data. But let's say if I run this, um, you cannot find the, let me just close this. Maybe it doesn't look properly. Uh, by the way, each chat is associated to each file. So if I do this, uh, it's a different context. So context of the chat is for each file. So, hi, yo. <coughs> Are you here? Okay, <laughs> here. Good. Uh, here, um, I have the um, uh, sample Python file. Let me check whether this works. Uh, let's say that is three, right? Let's say uh, uh, one more. For. So this is working. Let's say I'm going to run this uh, other file, um, but there's an error. Um, I I don't have the blood donation in this uh, directory. Um, do you still have the sure. the fix? We just yeah. I'm not typing. What you can see here is no. Alright. Just a little more. Are you running? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Run. And, and then let's say I uh, you already ran, so uh, I run the next one. Sure. Oops, data is not defined. Let's say I run this. Yeah, 
Oh, the previous one. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Okay. Can can you run the rest? Sure. So basically, you can use this. To, so two volunteers or more. Uh, think of it as a Google Doc, but we can sort of collaborate, work on the same notebook, uh, chat on the side. Okay, thanks for the help. Yeah, even though there's a there's an error, but know that uh, it's not me, uh, it's another volunteer, but it's good for this sort of collaboration. So, uh, previously, um, it might be hard to, let's say, share the notebook because let's say, uh, oh, let me work on it first, then once I'm done, I'll let pass to you, the, the, then you can do your stuff. But with this feature, maybe two or three of us can work on the same and then finish the job more quickly, more quickly. yeah? So that's the, thanks, Joe. Uh, that's the uh, collaboration feature. And then what we'll share also, um, there's more. Uh, this weekend, uh, we just uh, had Easter egg, so usually the team would like to share some Easter egg also. So um, a while ago, uh, during the first part of this uh, session, we opened an Azure notebook, right? So here in Azure, Azure notebook, no, this is not Azure notebook, where's my Azure notebook? Uh, yeah, this is Azure notebook. Azure, Azure notebook is a uh, uh, free platform for running Jupyter, but um, here, uh, you cannot see how do you, uh, if I want, this is launched as a normal Jupyter notebook. Can you see here, like how, where do we launch a Jupyter lab? Does it support Jupyter lab, right? Um, but uh, since we are talking about Easter eggs, what you can do is <coughs> click here, terminal, and then in the terminal, type lab. Hopefully. Oh, yeah. Yes. So that's uh, yeah. You see, you can actually, you can run Jupyter on another free platform, which is uh, Jupyter. The one a while ago that we and I used that was Binder. So there are like multiple platforms for uh, Jupyter Lab that you can use for free. Um, you can use that for exploring and learning. Uh, but in the let's say the Jupyter in the sorry in the data dive context, if you want to point here at the Docker package uh, <coughs> captain, uh, we'll try to go with a Docker approach so that at least we can version the whole uh, Jupyter lab environment. But for learning, you can store uh, other notebooks, you can store binders and so on. So let's. Uh, uh, yes, so as uh, Chuck shared, we have a uh, data dive uh, next, not this weekend, weekend, but the following weekend, that is April 13 to 15, 2018. If you want to our RSVP for those who haven't yet, RSVP, that's the tiny URL that will point to the meetup and then you can RSVP there. Yeah. And uh, before we thank the sponsors, any words from Oh yeah, so we have the we have some Azure uh, passes. Uh, we'll so how do we distribute this? Okay, so before you leave, we have uh, we have some Azure passes from Microsoft. So um, for all of sponsors, PayPal, thank you, thank you very much. We really much uh, this. Uh, the food, the drinks, and very uh, fantastic. And also uh, Microsoft for giving us the uh, free Azure passes. Uh, you can use this to uh, spin, like let's say if you're doing deep learning, I want to have extra compute power using uh, deep learning virtual machine. Um, you can use this to spin a uh, uh, VM cloud and then run up it. And of course, it's not only for the feature, you have to explore other features in Azure. It's, uh, uh, what I can see here is, uh, Hundred dollar. Hundred dollars for one month. Hundred dollar for one month. It's free money. <laughs> <laughs> and just, thanks Microsoft for that. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
Yes, uh, if, uh, if, I mean, ideally, um, because we, we will be pulling the religious government of love, right? In the last year's data learning, uh, that's the approach that we initially did. But of course, um, theory or let's say planning sometimes is quite different from expectations or reality. Uh, what we plan and the expectation because during the day of life last year, um, some work because uh, you can install uh, Docker, let's say, for platforms, right? But there are instances where we have issues in installing in some other workflows. So some might have issues and are not able to follow. But it's okay. That's why we have the pipeline. Uh, the pipeline, uh, we, this is pipeline in the view that uh, maybe some might not be able to do, uh, uh, use Docker, so they will use their own ID, uh, IDs. But at least the deliverables, whoever is volunteer as Docker captain, oh, we hope to encourage the volunteer as Docker captain because we want to do more. They will pass the deliverable to the Docker captain so that at least we will be able to use using the Docker ID. Thank you. Any other question? Uh, in regards to sensitive information, would it be better to use like this localized uh, approach or would it be better than private people instead? Uh, good question. Um, uh, so in the, in the way we do things in data kind, so so we separate the environment, right? So environment is one thing that's, that's okay. That is for running the code. So that is separate. On the other side, we have codes, codes that uh, we run for the analysis. And there's a third part also, which is data, right? Data that uh, this code runs on uh, to analyze. So depends on the non-profit, uh, on the uh, discussions we have, the engagement we have with uh, the non-profit. Some non-profits, they are okay with the uh, uh, data being public, but some non-profits, we need to have NDA, we have uh, to have a private uh, GitHub repository. So our, our other approach is to have a private GitHub repository, which uh, the data can only be limited. Any other questions? <coughs> So for those that haven't uh, tried the workshop, uh, you have the materials. Uh, when you go back home, uh, try again. Uh, that's the that you pull, uh, what you call this, uh, the image in Play With Docker. Uh, hopefully, let's say in some time of the day where the bandwidth is not that much, you can try again to pull. Otherwise, if you are uh, more adventurous to explore more Docker, you can install it in your machine and then uh, run it from there. Yeah, good. Um, yeah, so if, if, if there's any question, uh, feel free to contact me uh, on the meetup or we'll, if you're coming for the data dive next, next week, we hope to see you there as well. Thank you. Um, you can just come here and then pick, pick one. I think we should have enough. We, have, we only have like 50 of us. Yeah, so first come, first serve.